The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim was released by Bethesda on November 11th, 2011, and that means that from the day that you are watching this video, the game has been out for a total of 8 years, and is still played by thousands of users collectively every day. It still has between the original version of Skyrim and Skyrim Special Edition a combined 35,000 active players on PC, not to mention the tens of thousands of players on Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo Switch. The game was overall hugely successful, and is still to this day one of the best selling video games of all time. In this video, we are going to conduct an in-depth analysis as to what makes this game so great, why people are still playing it to this day, and also detail the flaws new players may experience while playing. This video will cover the good, the bad, and anything else I deem noteworthy. We will take a retrospective look back at what this game was upon release, what it has become, and what the future looks like for it. If you're like me, then you have completed many playthroughs of Skyrim before watching this video, so here I will put a disclaimer. This video may contain and will likely contain major plot spoilers, so if you haven't completed Skyrim yet, or one day plan on doing so, come back to this video later. I will be dividing this video up into categories with timestamps provided in the description so you can click off and return back later, or just skip to the more interesting parts. However, anyways, enough of me rambling, now that that's out of the way, without further ado, let's jump right into the video. The game begins with you in the back of a carriage, and you are accompanied by Ulfric Stormcloak, who is a major character in the game. The player is never told who they are or why they are being executed, however, it is speculated that you along with Stormcloak's soldiers and the other prisoner were all crossing the border into Skyrim when the player was captured. This is sort of a wrong place at the wrong time scenario, as since you are seen with Ulfric, it is assumed that you are a member of the Stormcloak Rebellion. Now the plot in Skyrim sort of revolves around this ongoing conflict between the Imperials and Stormcloaks. To make it short, the Stormcloaks feel that the Imperials from foreign lands are coming to Skyrim to colonize and extract valuable resources native to Skyrim. The Stormcloaks feel that it is a right to them because they are somewhat indigenous to the land. Basically, the Imperials want to come and add Skyrim to their ever-expanding empire and rule over the Stormcloaks and all of Skyrim's citizens. However, the Stormcloaks are saying no. Now, if you want the long version, the Imperials lost the Great War to the Aldomeri Dominion. As a condition of the peace agreement, which was called the White Gold Concordat, the Empires had to agree that Talos was not divine, thus reducing the recognized pantheon to eight divines rather than nine. Talos is a god and one of the nine divines. Talos is a major folklore to the Nords, so they see this capitulation as a major betrayal, as they have long been loyal to supporters of the Empire. In fact, many emperors came from that province. So the Stormcloaks were created to strike back at the Empire and the Dominion for persecuting those who worship Talos as a divine. There are many more nuances to this, such as why the Dominion wants the worship of Talos to end, but again, we can go into such an in-depth detail, there are a ton of fan theories on it, so if you're interested, I can link some below in the video description. Anyways, while you are waiting to be executed, you get to pick your character's race and his slash her appearance. Now, upon release of the game, character customization was pretty limited, yet still advanced for its time, but I'll explain what I mean. Video games nowadays have face scan technologies for players, Fallout had some sort of facial sculpting which allowed for almost endless character customization. With a retrospective look back from it today, Skyrim's character customization was pretty limited and lack truly endless combinations of visual appearances. Obviously, there are hundreds of mods that are free to download that will improve accessibility to these features, but we're trying to focus mainly on the core game and what it was upon release. I would have liked to see that upon release, more features and customizations options were available for my character. After all, this is who I would be doing my entire playthrough with and would want to take my time with it. I don't know about you guys, but I always spend approximately 10 to 20 minutes developing my character, and in Skyrim, it just seemed kind of limited. During the execution after one Stormcloak soldier is killed, you are then called up next. Well, the game gives you a dynamic animation where your head is thrown onto the chopping block. Suddenly, a dragon attacks the city of Helgen and everybody runs for cover. Events transpire and you are running through the burning city and have an encounter with a member of the Stormcloaks and a member of the Imperials. Remember, these are the two main factions of the game. Now, the game provides you a choice on who you want to escape the burning city with, either the Stormcloak or the Imperial. Now, I myself always choose the Stormcloaks because the Imperials literally just tried to kill you a minute ago, but the choice is technically up to you. You then go through a series of brief encounters with your respective enemies, and the tutorial is complete upon the exit of the cave beneath the main keep. There are a few things I would like to mention regarding the intro, however. I completely understand that in every Elder Scrolls game, you aren't given a ton of context on who you are, where you came from, and this is done in order for the player to choose and not be told what kind of character they want to be, which I completely understand.
Yeah, this is sort of contradicted when you later find out that you are the Dragonborn and it is your destiny to defeat Alduin, but more on that later. So if I'm the Dragonborn, does it matter what race I choose? It sort of seems contradictory to me. If the game is going to tell me what I have to do and who I am, then why not tell me who I am? I understand we can pick our own race appearance so each character would technically have a different backstory, and that's a great idea. The alternative start mod lets the player pick what their backstory is simply by giving us a short write-up on where we come from. I understand this may be hard to implement by a game developer, but it's just a thought. If every race was destined to be the Dragonborn, then it sort of seems redundant that we are the Dragonborn. I understand that every other player is going to pick either a Khajiit, an Argonian, or an Imperial, and to follow the main story we will all be Dragonborn, but it just doesn't really seem like it's up to fate or prophecy if it doesn't matter who you pick, you still have that same title, but maybe I'm just nitpicking. The fact that the Imperials sort of just let Ulfric get away is actually baffling to me. If he really was the traitor they say he is, and was being treated like the most dangerous man in all of Skyrim, how come he wasn't killed in another way? Why wouldn't the archers who completely wasted that poor guy in the beginning just take aim once the dragon landed? He wasn't burning down the city for about 10 seconds, so there would have been plenty of time to pop an arrow in Ulfric's back. My biggest problem with this is that it just takes away from the seriousness of the game when none of the events besides the dragon menace would have actually happened if one Imperial soldier could have mustered up the courage to just waste poor Ulfric instead of letting him go. He's not wearing any armor and his hands are bound. Just shoot him in the back and nothing would have happened. It's curious that Alduin completely torched an entire city in the very beginning. I mean, look at the place, it's completely in ruin. However, throughout the entire game, we never see another city damaged in any way, shape, or form by a dragon. There's the White Run Guard Tower, but that isn't anywhere the size of Helgen. What I'm trying to do is ask the question, why did Alduin suddenly attack Helgen? It's not like he knew who we actually were as the Dragonborn, otherwise we would have been burnt like toast at this very moment. We were completely defenseless, hands bound, and thrown in the mud. If he didn't have any problem burning the whole city, what's a quick unsuspecting dragonborn to fry? The beginning of the game instantly gives us a bias against the Imperials, because who would want to pick the side of the faction that just tried to murder us? Now I understand that we get a choice as to who we want to fight for, but I'm sure the majority of players picked Stormcloak. It's almost like the game had designed it that way. Choice is a wonderful thing to have in a role playing game, but even though we were given one, I feel like Bethesda sort of made that choice for us. The only only way someone wouldn't have picked Stormcloaks is unless the player wasn't paying attention to what was going on or had already done one playthrough, and that may have been the intention. The Stormcloaks and Imperial questline has options from both sides, so you're missing out on content depending on what side you pick. Now if you run off with Roloff, you still can join the Imperials later in the game, but I think we can all sum up all of our responses to this point. I'm pretty sure if someone walked into your house, and tried to murder you, all of a sudden a natural disaster outside happened, and that same person who tried to kill you said you must trust them to stay alive, you too would probably be skeptical to follow their lead. I feel like overall the intros in Elder Scrolls games are getting better and better. Morrowind was boring and dull, Oblivion's was just straight terrible, but Skyrim took a ton of steps in the right direction. You do get a sense that your character is a part of something bigger, which is an idea that I can totally get behind. The cave sequence below the Helgen Keep does give players a good basic understanding of things like swords, bows, magics and sneaking ability. This is implemented to expose the player to every type of playstyle so they can find what they like. Now I am a fan of this approach as it lets me decide what kind of person I want to be and how I want to fight in the game. It exposes me to different levels and variations of enemies so I can see how my certain playstyles will respond. Remember that we do not actually have to pick a class or any type of skill set like in Oblivion, so whatever way we fight is what skills will give us a major boost when trying to level up. If you're someone who uses your sword for every fight, upon leaving the cave it's likely that your one hand skill will be higher than your destruction magic skill level and so on. This makes leveling up in the game very easy as you will level up according to the playstyle. If you're a sneaky archer who's really good at illusion magic, then illusion magic, archery, and sneak is what's going to level you up the most. If you're someone who runs around with a shield and sword, your block and one-handed skills are going to be a lot higher than your archery or your conjuration magic. This was a big win for Skyrim. This gives the player choice and does not force any certain playstyle or requirements upon them as it was a great addition to the game. Overall, I did like the introductory scene and there are a ton of positives to be pointed out. There are areas of improvement, but they made it enjoyable and most players probably have very distinct memories of which faction they sided with, what style they played even years after completing a playthrough. It will be very interesting to see how the introductory scene evolves and changes in the next Elder Scrolls game. I know upon release there was a ton of criticism from fans, it just really depends if Bethesda chooses to follow it, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. 
Arguably one of the most important components of a video game comes down to two things, audio and video. How visually appealing is the game and how does the ambience and sound effects tie everything together? This will be a relatively small portion of this video, but very important nevertheless. The graphics of Skyrim have evolved heavily over the years. Back in 2011, the game looked great and was one of the best looking and most visually appealing games released for the time. The amount of attention and detail that the developers put into the game world was astonishing and every wide open plain, cave, broken building and rock looked fantastic. It was a huge improvement over Oblivion, as trees in Skyrim were modded off of actual images taken in forests, mountains were polished to look more real, and every static object in the game had enhanced variated textures. Upon the release of Skyrim Special Edition, the visuals were completely overhauled to include dynamic depth of field, god rays, and lighting improvements, enhanced floral textures, and so much more. The remaster itself brought the game's visuals to compare to other games on the next generation platform, Xbox One and PS4. It's important to keep in mind that Skyrim was originally released on the Xbox 360, PS3, and PC, so graphics were limited in order to remain playable. The frame rates of the game were also locked at 30 FPS for consoles, so PC players had the advantage and added smoothness of running it at 60 or even higher frames per second. Upon the release of Next Gen, the remaster for Skyrim gave it a massive facelift and is still arguably superior to many games today. Okay, fine, there are a ton of other games that look way better than Skyrim does, but you need to keep in mind it's originally modeled after after a game that released nearly a decade ago. I play Skyrim Special Edition today and still think that in my opinion it is a fantastic looking game. That being said, there is a nearly limitless amount of mods available to enhance the game's graphics all the way up to 8K texture updates, weather enhancements, realistic water mechanics and visuals, enhanced blood textures, and so much more. There is also an unofficial plugin for the game called ENB, which essentially plays with the sliders in the game code to change the way the game generates graphics as shown here. As you can see, I can toggle the ENB on and off to show the different textures. This is completely customizable and the player can tweak the ENB however he or she may choose. Pretty neat, right? The score in the Elder Scrolls is one of the finest released by Bethesda. If you like the background music you're hearing in in this video, then you will love playing Skyrim because it is the same ambience as written and developed by Jeremy Sewell. He is the brains behind the score for Morrowind, Oblivion, and many other video games, including Skyrim. The music complements the gameplay so well, from the fast-paced action music, to the Dragonborn score, and even the ambience music played in all unique locations of the game. I have personally spent hundreds of hours inside the world of Skyrim over the years, and I have not once gotten bored or tired of the soundtrack. Jeremy has a proven track record of excellence and I must say that Skyrim is one of his masterpieces. The game does a good job of deciding when to play certain themes. Mud crabs and other lower level enemies don't trigger super fast paced action music while boss level enemies and dragons have their own dedicated score slash soundtrack. One thing that was really annoying about Oblivion is that you'd run into a mud crab and all of a sudden this boss level music would come on and it kind of took you out of the immersion of the game. The sound effects for doing things like swinging a sword, shooting a bow, jumping, walking, running, all mesh really nicely with the game. There are no sound delays or anything of note to mark as an issue. The Skyrim soundtrack is another flawless masterpiece by Jeremy Soule and the audio engineers at Bethesda. Their attention to detail and passion for their work is one of the many factors that makes an Elder Scrolls game feel like an Elder Scrolls game. The combat and game mechanics in Skyrim, when you think about it, are actually some of the most important elements in a game such as The Elder Scrolls, as you are constantly moving, fighting, jumping, running, or blocking enemy attacks. For the sake of this retrospective, we must quickly contrast this to the previous version of The Elder Scrolls, Oblivion. In Oblivion, the combat system was god-awful, and let's just leave it at that. Swords were swung in a very distinct, linear way, bows were shot in a very unsatisfying way, and once you began firing an area, you either A, had to shoot it, or B, shoot it at the ground in order Order to pick it back up again. Running in Oblivion looked weird and awkward as you could be moving forward yet diagonally at the same time, the animations were poor, jumping looked awkward and that in my opinion was actually one of the most disappointing components of the entire game. Oblivion also had horrible enemy combat AI. Sometimes you wouldn't be attacked while you were up close to an enemy and enemy tracking was flawed in a way where opponents pathfinded into walls and over obstacles. It wasn't surprising when Bethesda went with the whole tear it down and start over approach to refining combat, animations, and 
different in-game mechanics in Skyrim. If you're watching this entire retrospective in one sitting, you're going to realize that the whole tear it down and start over approach is used several times by Bethesda. Skyrim, on the other hand, has all brand new running, jumping, walking, and sneaking mechanics, which were a much welcomed addition to Oblivion. I'll talk about the animations first relating to player movement, and then I'll touch on combat separately. Getting from point A to point B is something that I was incredibly happy with in Skyrim. Not only was a sprint system added to increase player movement, but jumping, walking, and running animations were all completely overhauled. This was a very welcomed addition and overall made the game more enjoyable and playable. Weapon animations, in my opinion, needed some additional work. With the amount of time you will spend in the game swinging a sword, dagger, or axe, there should be a more dynamic range of animations for the player to do. Just imagine how much more real the game would feel if there was 30 different animations for swinging a sword, and which one you did was reliant on how much stamina you had, how much health you had, etc. Imagine if the way you swung your sword had to do with how much damage you would take. Full health meant more powerful attacks where less health meant desperately swinging the sword with less accuracy and power. This would give you an advantage over opponents who were weaker than you, and you could simply overpower them and possibly not take a lot of damage. However, on the other hand, higher level opponents would require you to be conscious of your blocking ability to reduce damage while still swinging at the opportune moments. If the player is a highly skilled warrior, he should be able to cut through mud crabs, horkers, and draugr very easily and not take a lot of damage, where fighting a bandit may be somewhat more difficult once you encounter them. It seems like in Skyrim, once you figure out the pattern of the enemy's AI, it is easy to win any fight, as there is a distinct repetition of swing, block, swing swing while the opponent is staggered, etc. This takes away from the immersion and realism that the game is supposed to capture, and makes you feel like you're playing an arcade sort of video game, and not a large dynamic open world which responds to your actions. Sneaking during combat is excellent however, with sneaking being more successful and powerful the higher your level is, which I am definitely a fan of. Bow combat feels incredibly responsive and dynamic with damage being done based upon how far you pull the arrow back and the player being able to pull back arrows once loaded into the weapon. Sneak does twice the amount of damage and you can upgrade this by using skill perks which I like. Sometimes you will get a custom attack animation which is used specifically for finishing off enemies to make the combat feel more satisfying. The problem is these animations are sort of broken and I can't tell you the amount of times they've lagged or the game has shown me cutting down nothing. The sneaking ones are really cool because it'll show an arrow traveling or a throat being slit. I'll briefly touch on magic as it is a part of the game. Spells look great and magic combat with the use of wards is definitely a nice addition. The amount of damage that they do relies on how adept you are at that skill, which rewards players for sticking towards one playstyle. Overall animations in the game were up to standard back in release upon 2011, but have not exactly aged very well when you compare this to games like The Witcher or newer RPGs. However, I guess you can attribute that to the game simply showing its age in a way that no remaster or patch can change, as we progress further and further away from the game's initial release date. The animations in future Elder Scrolls games will simply have to be reworked as they no longer cut it in 2019. Role-playing games generally have some sort of leveling system, where the player can progress from level 1 to level 10, to level 50, and so on. Every game developer has a different method for leveling, and even Bethesda has had their own system undergo massive changes over time. Now, I'm not going to go super in-depth and compare Skyrim's leveling system to every other game out there, but we will again contrast it to the previous installment of the franchise, The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. The Oblivion leveling system is personally one that I completely hate and despise every time I get ready for a new playthrough. The game forces you before completion of the opening tutorial to pick a class. This class will determine what kind of player you want to be. If you want to be a mage, then it's suggested that alteration, destruction, and conjuration magic skills are likely skills you would add to this class. This is so when you increase them, you have a higher amount of experience gained towards your overall level. What I don't like about this is it forces you to essentially create a new character and start the game over again if you want to change your playstyle. When playing Skyrim, your main skills will level you up more, but they can be changed at any time. In Oblivion, you are forced forced to stick with what you go with in the beginning. If you get to level 20 and decide to become a sneaky archer who is good at using a sword, you will not be able to level up nearly as fast as if you'd used magic mainly. Now I did discuss all of this briefly earlier, but Oblivion's leveling system also had a ton of obvious exploits in it as well. If athletics and acrobatics were two of your main skills, then you would essentially level up just from playing the game as the player is constantly running and jumping all over the place. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but your athletics and acrobatics 
Addicts will reach level 100 before your Blade or Block skills likely reach 50. You could leave your player running against a wall and put a weight on your controller overnight, which would gain you 50 levels within that time. It also didn't make a ton of sense that when you leveled up, you had to pick from a list of attributes like Strength, Charisma, Luck, and etc. to increase per level. This would benefit certain skills you had picked for your class, but some would be left behind in the process. For example, if you upgraded Strength, this would govern your carry weight limit, and your block, blade, armorer, and other skills relating to that attribute. This is how many items you can carry in the sense of carry limit weight. If you are a mage character, there is no need to increase strength because it does not directly benefit the skills you had likely chosen in the beginning. An increase in block and blade has no benefit regardless of what the mage is trying to do they're not going to be using those sort of weapons. Increasing this skill takes away from points you would add into intelligence or willpower, which can be used for magicka increases and would benefit a character playing as a mage. Maybe I'm just being picky, but you can obviously see where many of the flaws of this system stem from. But enough about Oblivion, let's move on now to Skyrim. When Bethesda was conceptualizing Skyrim, they clearly realized when and where they had screwed up, which was actually a really good thing. They got rid of skill classes entirely and moved to a strictly player-driven leveling system. As I touched on earlier, the player will level up by increasing the skills that they use the most. So one more time, and I'm probably beating this to death, but if your playstyle is a sneaky archer, Sneak and Archery will likely be a higher skill than Conjuration, for example. That means that increasing your Conjuration skill will provide a small boost towards your level. However, a Sneak increase will move the needle much further. This was a fantastic idea and hopefully we will see it carry forward into the next iteration of Elder Scrolls game. This gives all the power to the player and allows us to make the choices that benefit our interests and playstyles. Now, there are some skills that are incredibly difficult to level such as enchanting, smithing, and alchemy, so let's talk about these three skills now. These skills are all centered around an in-game crafting system, and they all work about the same so for the interest of time we will focus on one skill, smithing. Although it is different, it follows the same principle. To increase your smithing skill, you have to, you guessed it, create and smith things. Creating weapons, armor, jewelry, other materials, and improving materials on a workbench or grindstone will provide a boost to your smithing skill. However, it would be almost impossible for a player to level up to 100 in this skill by organically playing the game. In order to increase your smithing skill to level 100, the player must create approximately 3,000 iron daggers, which require one iron ingot and one leather strip. This is the fastest way to increase your level for this skill, which will in turn increase your overall player level as well. The reason you'd want to increase your smithing skill to 100 is because once you reach that cap, you are able to create some of the best armor in the game. I actually don't have any problem with this, and I wish there was another way to increase the skill level instead of this crafty grinding, but when you think about it, there really isn't any other way. This is what Bethesda must have thought when designing how this skill would increase, and you really can't blame them for it. Skill training is available, which makes a lot more sense, and I'm a huge fan of this system. You can interact with someone who, for a price, or possibly possibly as a reward for a quest, will teach you more about the skill thus increasing the skill level. You are limited to training only 5 times per level, and I think that's incredibly fair and balanced. This makes a lot of sense in my opinion, and it's very likely that in real life we learn skills from people who are more adept at them than we are. This is how we educate ourselves and learn things in school, on the job, or even at home. This brings us to my second point about the leveling system. Every time you level up your player, your player is granted a perk point or skill point. This allows you to get unique abilities, damage increases, damage resistance increases, and a lot more. I really like this as for example, should you level up your speech skill high enough, you can sell stolen goods to any merchant in the game, whereas normally there were only a few people who would buy them from you. If you use enough skill points and build up the tree far enough, you are able to access that feature. This is a small example of the unique abilities one can unlock should they increase a skill high enough, giving you a true sense of reward and achievement while playing the game. It also gives you the perception that you have clearly mastered an ability, and have an advantage over the game that only you were responsible for getting. If a player upgrades his slash her sneak skill high enough, you will be able to do a silent roll while sneaking, which can move the player from point A to point B faster while remaining undetected. However, 
you must use skill points to unlock this. If a player upgrades his or her archery skills high enough, you're now able to zoom in and slow time while using your bow so you can lock in on targets easier. It becomes difficult for the player to essentially spread those perks around, and here's what I mean. It is impossible for the player to max every single skill level to 100, and get every single effect slash perk from that skill. Each skill requires approximately 10 skill perks in order to get the mastery level knowledge of that skill. So if you take this and multiply it by about 30 skills, you will not be able to use the final ability for each skill with a player. If you are a mage character and you put hundreds of hours into this game, you can max out your restoration, destruction, and conjuration skills using perk points for example, but this will likely not leave you any more points to put into skills such as alteration, sneak, or even speech. I do like this feature however, as it really makes me think about what core competencies I want to give to my player. It actually makes me think about where I want to invest my time slash points in order to shape my character's skills around my playstyle. If there was no sense of sacrifice involved with the perk system, I feel like the sense of reward and accomplishment would otherwise be non-existent. Overall, the leveling system has proven to be a lot better than previous installments of it in other Bethesda games. I would like to see something similar return that rewards players based upon skill usage instead of capitulating to a predetermined skill class before the player is exposed to the game world and many of the game's features. In the Elder Scrolls Skyrim, there are many different forms of dungeons to explore. There are caves, mines, forts, Nordic ruins, dwarven ruins, Falmer caves, vampire lairs, bandit outposts, just to name a few. It is almost always unclear what enemies you will encounter when exploring these locations. Some are unique and indigenous to the dungeons such as Falmer in Falmer Caves or Dwemer in Dwemer Ruins. However, for the most part, the game keeps you guessing with a flurry of different enemies and creatures for the player to encounter. I found that this made the game more challenging as most of the time I did not know what enemies to prepare for upon entrance to these locations. I am a player who plays the game on a relatively high difficulty and need to make every bit of extra bonus damage count. This gave me a sense of immersion and had me in a ready for anything attitude while playing. One of the main components to an Elder Scrolls game is the dungeons that the players can explore. We will be talking about quests later in the video, but I will say here that most quests involve the player going to an ancient ruin, cave, fortress, or unique area after retrieving something or killing someone. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. In Oblivion, these same quests felt really redundant because of every cave looking similar. The amount of repetition involved within exploring those areas was enough to give the player a migraine. It seemed like every cave, ruin, fort, and camp was identical, just spaced evenly throughout the game world. Skyrim takes a much different approach, and it is important to note that in retrospect, Skyrim was developed by a team of less than 100 people. Now obviously in Skyrim, some of the dungeons feel the same, but all feature similar rooms or areas that may draw similarities to other locations in the game, however they all remain consistent with the architecture or commonalities associated with a Nordic ruin for example. If that didn't make any sense, I'll explain now what I mean. Every Nordic ruin will contain some form of hallway with coffins or draugr sleeping on the sides of the walls, but that is because that was a common design in these ruins, not because the developers were lazy. Skyrim does a good job of making every Nordic ruin feel like a Nordic ruin, but not the same Nordic ruin, if that makes any sense whatsoever. There is a huge difference between similarities and copying pasting game assets into the same shell, which is something that I appreciate and many fans of the series appreciate as well. I've spent hundreds of hours inside the game personally and rarely find myself remembering exact rooms slash areas inside of these said dungeons. Now obviously there are some ruins which tie directly into major quest lines that I completely remember. However, these do not seem repetitive if I go and play through them again. If you ever find yourself completing multiple playthroughs, but wonder why dungeons feel so repetitive, that is to be expected since the dungeons are tied directly into major points of emphasis in the game. Bleak Falls Barrow is going to feel like Bleak Falls Barrow because it is the first place the player is sent upon entrance of the main story, but we'll talk more about that later. What I'm trying to get at is there is an incredible sense of variation amongst different locations in the game, and it is very impressive that this was achieved by such a small group of people. Almost all dungeons in the game have a final room where there's a boss level enemy, likely a word wall for learning a certain shout, and a final boss level chest full of enchanted or otherwise valuable 
valuable items. Some players argue that this adds to the repetitiveness and provides an anticlimactic finish to the completion of exploration. I disagree. I feel personally that this added reward gives me reason and purpose to explore and clear dungeons all the way to the end. The loot and word learned from the word wall is randomized, so I never have any idea of what I'm going to get. I would say that over 75% of dungeons in the game have some sort of unique backstory or character at the end so there's always a sense of uncertainty and unfamiliarity associated with what I'm going to run into at the end. One of the most welcomed additions of dungeon exploration in Skyrim is that 99% of the locations in the game feature a fast exit to the end. In previous games like Oblivion, you would spend 20 minutes running to the fourth level of a dungeon, then being forced to run all the way back after completing it. Skyrim does a good job of having a unique exit, whether it is back to the first area you see and then out the front door, or some unique exit that's unmarked marked on your map that you will only see should you clear the dungeon all the way to the end. Overall, I'm quite happy with the dungeon locations in the game, and they have a very good sense of differentiation coupled with unique backstories and one-of-a-kind characters and items. The difference between Skyrim and Oblivion in this regard is night and day, and in 2019, people are still finding secrets, items, and other things hidden by developers almost a decade prior. This is going to be one of the longer portions of this video, however arguably the most important. Quests are the different types of objectives presented to the player in-game. A player may obtain a quest through a certain NPC, reading a book, finding an item, listening to a conversation, or even randomly throughout the game world. Completing these quests may advance you further in a specific storyline or questline, or allow the player to receive a unique item as a reward upon completion. They may allow you to access a new unique area you would have not been able to otherwise, and so on. Quests can pop up at any time, and with each playthrough, your order of completing them may be totally different. Some quests will result in the same outcome for every player and are very structured and set to be completed one way, while other quests give the player a sense of choice and your actions will truly affect how the game world looks in the future. What I'm getting at is that quests in Skyrim are unique. Some are mandatory, some aren't mandatory, and some give you more choice than others. Some quests may be available to a player based on a decision they have made prior, but we'll get more into that later. At no point in time must a certain quest be completed. You can complete 99% of the game before you even touch the main story, the choice is given to the player. The game will also generate radiant quests that will go on forever should you continue to repeat them. This sounds like the definition of insanity, but my point is that you will never run out of things to do while inside the game world. Now it is impossible for this video to outline every quest in the game, but I will give you my thoughts on two quests just as examples to show you the different types and how your decisions affect the outcome and reflect how sometimes you aren't given a choice. There is a quest in Skyrim titled In My Time of Need, which is given to you randomly upon the entrance to Whiterun. The quest begins with several Alakir warriors from Hammerfell inside the city gates being told by the guards that they must leave. It is possible to run past them and mind your own business, but eventually they will stop you and say they are looking for a Redguard woman who is a fugitive. They tell the player that they are not permitted inside Whiterun and will be waiting in Rorikstead for news should you find her. They say that they will make it worth your while and that you are doing a great service to the public by finding this woman and bringing her to justice. You must then ask around the city until you finally catch wind that the Redguard woman is inside the Bannered Mare Inn. Upon talking to her, she will say she has something to tell you and bring you upstairs. Once you make it up the stairs and into a secluded area, she will pull out a knife and threaten you, demanding why you are looking for her and how you know who she is. The player is thus presented with a choice, inform the Alakir of who she is, or assist the Redguard woman and wipe out the Alakir warriors, essentially setting her free from persecution. This allows the player to listen to both sides, get context within the situation, and then pick her fate. It allows you to decide what player you want to be, and truly give you actions with consequences. You must decide something and live with that choice. Killing the Alakir may provide the player with more loot, more gold, and more weapons and armor from the dead warriors to sell for profit. However, it may lead to an innocent person being detained and brought home to await trial for a crime she did not commit. Maybe she's guilty, maybe she isn't guilty. You, as the player, get to make that decision. Maybe I'm just reading too much into this or I'm way more invested in the game than the average player, but I appreciate having quests like this in the game where I must decide the outcomes and those outcomes may be different. On another playthrough, I may decide the other way and see what the game has in store for me. My second example is a quest titled A Chance Arrangement. This quest is triggered when you travel to Riften and seek Brynjolf standing in the main marketplace. Perhaps you needed to see him as a requirement for another quest, 
Perhaps you were just walking by, or maybe you never run into him at all, but that is for you, the player, to determine. Should you run into him, he will stop you and question your wealth, then offer you participation in a certain arrangement, he calls it, or scheme. It is obvious that Brynjolf is a dishonest character and kind of sleazy, and if your character is about that sort of thing, you can participate, but if your character is not, you don't have to. Again, the game allows you to make that choice for yourself. He will tell you that he is going to cause a distraction, and that he wants you to break into Medesi's lockbox and steal his silver ring. Once you have it, then proceed to plant the ring on Branshai. We are given no reason as to why we are doing this, but we are told we will be rewarded with gold, which should be incentive enough. Upon completion, Brynjolf will thank you for helping him, and inform you that his organization has been going through some troubles lately. If you're interested, you can meet him at the Ragged Flagon beneath the city in the sewers, and he will discuss the matter further. Now this is obviously an entrance into one of the game's major quest lines, which is the Thieves Guild. However, if you're not interested in this sort of thing, you will never have to speak with him again. The Thieves Guild is about 10 to 15 hours of content packed into the game, and it is not necessary that you go through and complete it. Again, your actions have consequences or you can open up a facet of the game that you may find interesting and may have never found otherwise. What I like most about the quests in Skyrim is that they aren't forced upon you and you may choose what to complete at any given time. There are also smaller, faster quests that don't require as much thought that are often tagged in the miscellaneous quest category. I will now give you a few examples of these and why I like them. In Riften, while speaking to the blacksmith Balaymund, there is a dialogue option to basically ask him how he's so good at what he does. He offers expert level smithing training, so naturally the player would ask him something like this. He proceeds to tell you that his forge uses fire salts to burn hotter than the typical forge, and that he's actually running short on them. If you bring him 10, he'll pay you good money for them. Whenever you run across fire salts in the game from that point forward, it will prompt you a reminder saying that you have found 1 of 10, 2 of 10, or 10 of 10 fire salts. If you bring them back to him, he'll give you some money and Balamund will be much happier with your character. This is something incredibly simple that gives so much depth to the game, and there are hundreds of characters who will have something similar to this for the player to do should he or she choose to do so. Another miscellaneous radiant quest is asking one of the many Jarl's stewards for work. They will likely tell you that the Jarl of that hold has placed a bounty on a group of bandits, dragon, or creature that's been causing trouble in their land of governance. Should you take care of this for the Jarl's court, you will be rewarded in gold plus any loot that comes across on your way. I personally love the dragon bounty radiant quests as you discovered another unique location along with whatever else you found along the way, gain dragon bones and scales after slaying the dragon which are incredibly valuable, learned a word of power for shouting off of the word wall, and also likely had a boss level chest to loot. These quests took anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes depending on your skill level, and the rewards made them much worth completion. There are also much larger, longer, and difficult quests that can unlock some of the best features slash items in the game. I could make a 10 hour video explaining these quests, but I will focus on my favorite which is titled No Stone Unturned. Throughout your time in Skyrim, it is incredibly likely that you will discover this pink gem, and once you add it to your inventory, the quest will begin asking you to take it to an appraiser. Whomever you bring it to will instruct you to bring it to Vex in the Ratway of Riften, and she is the authority on these sorts of items. She will tell you that the stone is worth nothing alone, but that if you collect all 24, it is incredibly valuable. You are not given quest markers or anything for these 24 stones, as they are all hidden throughout Skyrim. Upon release for the first few months of the game, everyone was struggling to find these as no official guide or notes on how to complete the quest was available. Once official guides came out, you can now find out on the internet the exact locations of every single gem, and once you collect all 24, you may return to Vex. This quest adds incredible depth to the game, and if it wasn't for the existence of the internet, some players may never have completed this or spent countless hours searching to find all of the stones. If you bring them all to Vex, you will be shocked that you collected them all, and tell you that they aren't worth anything unless they are mounted on the original crown of Baron Zaya. She knows the location of the crown and instructs you to go retrieve it. The location you are sent to is one of the most daunting and grueling dungeons in the game, which adds to the challenge and difficulty of the quest. If you have not completed it, I am not going to put this on screen as I do not want to spoil the epic ending. Once you retrieve it, you are gifted by Vex with the Prowler's Prophet ability, which is one of the most powerful and broken abilities in the game. The ability allows you to find precious gems in almost every chest you open, which you can sell for thousands and thousands of gold coins. 
This is my favorite quest and ability in the game, as after hours and hours of grinding, you are rewarded with a truly unique ability that you could not obtain otherwise. Everyone is going to have their own opinion, but I found that the quests in Skyrim were well thought out. Yes, obviously some quests were better than others, and there are some that I steer clear of, but nothing incredibly glaring that I must point out for this review. The game literally has a never-ending supply of things to do. There are quests that only unlock the higher the level you are, and some that randomly occur. I feel that Skyrim has an incredible amount of depth to it, which was something I appreciated a lot in my many playthroughs. The true dedication by the developers and writers charged with the quest creation creates a thorough and interesting bank of quests for the player to complete. This coupled with great writing and shocking events that catch the player off guard combine for a truly enjoyable experience. After the backlash from fans relating to Oblivion and the NPCs, Skyrim once again used the same tear it down and start over tactics when designing the player interaction systems in Skyrim. Before we look at Skyrim's and how it holds up, once again we will take a look back at Oblivion and I will go over all of the truly shocking and hilarious flaws that comes with it. The first problem with Oblivion was that there was only 15 voice actors including all downloadable content. That means for every NPC in the game, there was only 15 voices to choose from. Now you can even boil that down further because some of those actors were locked to one NPC so there was even less of a pool to choose from. This resulted in every single Redguard character sounding the same, every Argonian sounding the same, every Breton sounding the same, etc, etc. In Oblivion, it was so messed up that some Imperials sounded like Orcs, some Nords sounded like Dark Elves, and it was all a jumbled mess. Thank you, kind lady. He's a fairy tale. Good thing we have the Black Horse. He's a fairy. Good thing we have the... We'll see. We'll see. Every little bit helps. Are you looking for him? He's a fairy. Are you looking for him? I think I... To learn more about the... Gr Something to report? Stop right there, criminal scum! You would have two completely different races of people who sounded exactly alike. Characters had literally the exact same voices, and this is what made the game so frustrating and annoying to play. The other issue was the conversations with the NPCs. Their AI made talking to them so weird and uncomfortable. When you would talk to an NPC, the game would freeze behind them and time stood still. Based on their disposition towards you, they would either be smiling, frowning, or be angry with you. Facial animations were completely broken, mouth patterns didn't match what they were saying, and it was incredibly disappointing. Also, the whole disposition meter minigame made absolutely no sense whatsoever. You could make people like you more based on boasting, joking, or admiring, and half the time it didn't even work. This was such a stupid addition to the game, and I'm glad that it was taken out for Skyrim. In Oblivion, people wouldn't tell you things unless you had increased their disposition high enough to make them like you. Are you the Count? You're a liar. Are you the Count? Then go away! If you were playing a Khajiit character or an Argonian character, people inherently would just hate you because they were racist. This would lead the player to have to spend almost 100 gold every single time to get them to talk to you. Certain NPCs would not divulge rumors without them liking you enough. Most people played likable races, or they just bribed the NPCs so they would not have to sit through the garbage that was the disposition wheel in the first place. But I digress. Oblivion's voice acting was a mess, the conversation system was flawed. Looked around Jensen. That big galleon it's down amazing there. what people will get rid of. Have you ever met who Jensen's better than the Balonir, especially if you need many people. I've heard of the Sage City. And she'll teach others. So I've heard of the Sage Have you heard? Adamus Philippe has the news from the other parts of the Sage the Dark Brother I'd like to talk about. I've heard others say the same. May I help you? Have you heard? Farewell. Adamus Philippe has been killed. Have you heard? Murdered. Adamus Philippe has been killed. Murdered so by the heard. Dark Brotherhood. Bye. NPCs looked awful, everything was wrong, so once again, Skyrim did a tear it all down and start over approach, and boy did they ever. Now onto the positives. Firstly, Skyrim had a total of 70 voice actors, some who did multiple voices, and there was over 60,000 lines of total dialogue recorded. Another major issue with Oblivion is that certain citizens would say the exact same things to each other. I will firstly say that yes, there are characters in Skyrim who have the same voice which is similar to Oblivion. The difference is, is that you rarely encounter it and it was never a noticeable thing for me in many playthroughs. It's almost as Bethesda had the attention to detail to space those characters out throughout the game world 
so you would not run into them in certain progression. This made the game overall feel more diverse and enjoyable. Secondly, they completely got rid of player disposition, thank the Nine Divines. Players could use persuasion, intimidation, or bribes in some conversations, and it was all based off your competencies in the skill of speech. When you spoke with an NPC, the game kept on going around them. The background didn't freeze, which was a very nice touch. The camera also didn't zoom in on them so much, which was one of my biggest issues with Oblivion as I stated earlier. NPCs had different AI patterns when talking with the player, and the variety of characters made the conversations with them much more enjoyable. One thing I forgot to mention earlier was how all Oblivion characters looked ugly and some were very similar. Skyrim characters rarely look the same. This is likely due to the increased character customization available on a newer game, but my overall experience with NPC interaction was much better than the previous games by Bethesda. Follower AI is still buggy sometimes as they tend to get in the way of certain areas. Sometimes quest givers don't say the things you want them to, or you have to wait in game for certain text fields to populate, However, all of these are fixed with the unofficial Elder Scrolls patch, which is free using the in-game mod launcher. There is a massive difference between Oblivion and Skyrim when it comes to NPCs, and it's very positive to see the company building off of their previous mistakes. In my opinion, the Stormcloaks vs Imperials conflict was one of the biggest disappointing missed opportunities in the entire game. There is so much wrong with this questline that I don't even know where to begin, and the way it affects the game and world still baffles me to this day. Remember, I have poured hundreds of hours into Skyrim before and completed this questline from both sides, and I'm unhappy with both of the endings. I understand that the two main factions in Skyrim must participate in war to determine who rules, but I don't really feel like that even happens in this game. So where should I start? Let's start with a brief recap of what I said at the beginning of the video. Ulfric survives having his hands bound, surrounded by enemy soldiers, completely defenseless, and a dragon attack. So there's that to begin with, and I won't bother repeating it. He is the most important character in the entire game, arguably, and there would be no war to be had if he was dead. The whole premise of this conflict is that Skyrim is in the midst of a civil war that has incredibly harsh effects on the residents of the province. The thing is though, other than the odd patrol of three soldiers per faction, or the camps set up around Skyrim with five to six soldiers at each one, we never ever see any effects of the war on anybody, anything, or anywhere. As far as I'm concerned, business just kind of carries on as normal, and the war isn't even a minor inconvenience. The only thing the Civil War does is damage parts of Whiterun and replace the Jarl, and damages parts of Solitude once you complete the 5-10 to 10 hour questline. We never see any other effects of the conflict which leads us to believe, was there even really any conflict to begin with? It seemed like everyone in Skyrim was terrified of being slaughtered by whatever opposing force they chose to side with, but it never happened. We never saw Imperial soldiers in the various inns around Skyrim causing trouble. Never saw large armies marching on cities or nothing. There are two quests where you attack Whiterun and then Solitude, but that was it. All of the quests relating to the conflict require the player to attack or defend a certain fort and kill enough of the opposition until that fort is claimed by either the Imperials or the Stormcloaks. I never once felt like my efforts were being recognized or had any lasting impacts on the world that I was playing in besides permanently trashing one of my favorite cities in the game and pissing me off every time I walked by it. My main point is that I never really felt like there was a civil war which was a huge missed opportunity in my opinion. You hear citizens complaining about it all the time, but you never see any hardships, taxes on goods, children starving, people starving, shortage of resources, and so on. Apparently there are sieges of other cities in Skyrim embedded inside the game code, but they were subsequently scrapped prior to release. Maybe it was too much content to be polished and there was not enough time, or they would have interfered with other events in the game. We'll never know this though, and other modders have tried to recreate these events, but today we're focusing on the vanilla game for relation to this video. Now I understand that Skyrim based this game towards the mass public, and they're not going to include things like children and people starving, dying of disease, etc. in their video game. But it takes away some of the added realism when there's a war fought without any consequences. The next thing that I take issue with in this conflict is the fact that it ties to the main story. Now the main story we will talk about in a little bit, and when we talk about it, remember this part of the video. There's a part where you convince both sides to negotiate a truce, well, you can slay Alduin. If you complete the Liberation of Skyrim questline for either side, when you get to the main story, you actually can skip this part. If not, you must participate in it. The main problem is that both sides are willing to negotiate a truce because the dragons are getting in the way of the war effort. Both sides, General Tullius and Ulfric Stormcloak, 
claim that the dragon attacks are causing huge problems with their supply lines and in the cities that they control. The problem is, we never see any of it. You have no idea how something as simple as a random encounter where a dragon burns a carriage carrying Stormcloak supplies would have added to the believability that the dragons were this much of an issue in the first place. I understand that the dragons sometimes attack cities when you were inside of them, but they do no lasting damage and at least leave nothing that we see get repaired over time. It is this major problem for both sides, but we never see any repercussions of it, which takes away from the believability and immersion. The questline is also completely radiant, so if you're someone who doesn't like doing the same thing over and over again, you're probably not going to be too much of a fan. Go to the fort, kill the Imperials, check in with your captain, then do it again. That is the entire questline and it gets incredibly repetitive and boring after a while. I found myself upon completing this the first time many years ago, just wanting to get it over with because I was convinced that the results of the war effort was going to completely change the landscape of Skyrim. I thought that with the Stormcloaks in power everything was going to change, however nothing really did. The major difference is that the guards in Imperial control cities change, but when you're running through a city who pays attention to what NPC stands next to the gate? This is a very small area of critique, but what I absolutely hated was when I was playing as a Stormcloak soldier, you would run into Imperial camps. I wanted to run in and burn everything to the ground and slaughter everyone in sight. The problem is, is once you kill everyone at the camp, the leader, or captain, is invulnerable and cannot be wiped out. This just bothered me as it took away from my immersion and realism I was looking for while playing the game. Imagine how much better it would have been if when you found a camp, you could go and kill everyone, even just clicked a button on a torch to set the place on fire. If you left and returned, the camp would have been gone or left in ruin, or perhaps a Stormcloak camp being put up on the ruins. It would have made you feel like your actions had a lasting impact on the game world, which was once again a huge miss opportunity. This is the part of the video where I talk about Skyrim's main questline and what I like and dislike about it. Any areas of note I will talk about, but let's get right into it. To sum up the entire main story though, here's a brief explanation and then we will get into the analysis. The character that you play is what is called Dragonborn, meaning if he or she kills dragons, you have the ability to absorb their soul. This means that the dragon is dead for good and cannot be revived by Alduin. Alduin is the main enemy in the game and is responsible for bringing dragons back to life. He is also also the guy who burned down Helgen in the beginning, just for reference. In order to defeat the dragons, you talk to some members of the Blades who are an organization that once was responsible for protecting the Emperor of Tamriel and also fighting dragons in the past. The Blades will tell you that you must learn a shout called Dragonren to use on these dragons. This makes them come down from the sky and land on the ground, so you have a chance to kill them. The main story has you use Dragonren on a dragon to tell you where Alduin is, so then you can travel there through a portal and defeat Alduin in Sovngarde. Sovngarde is a place where dead Nords go in the afterlife, and once you kill Alduin in there, he is gone for good. Now that is a very rough, very short, yet entire breakdown of the main story, so now I will zone in on certain areas and tell you what I think is wrong with it. And there is a lot to be said. The main story begins with you escaping Helgen as mentioned earlier, and then going to warn the Jarl of Whiterun about the dragon attack on Helgen. Helgen was the first time a dragon had attacked Skyrim, and in fear about the dragon attacking the nearby cities, we go and try to get help. This makes complete sense and I completely understand why it's in the game. The only thing is that when we get to Riverwood to warn them too, they've already seen it, so it's not like us running to warn them would have done any good anyways. We then learn that Riverwood is totally underdefended, and we need to go ask the Jarl of Whiterun to send more soldiers there, to protect the city. However, the problem is they only send like three people. If you go to Riverwood after the Jarl orders a detachment of soldiers there, there doesn't really seem to be any effect. Remember that this dragon just wiped out an entire legion of soldiers and burned a giant stone city, and a few soldiers is supposed to protect Riverwood? Shouldn't the entire province be terrified and all consolidate forces in order to eliminate the threat? None of that happens and the Jarl suggests that since we saw this dragon, we can be of some use to his court wizard who is researching dragons or something. He then sends you to go and retrieve something called the Dragonstone, which is nowhere in the entire story and we never see any use for it. It is never referenced once ever again, so I'm going to make the assumption that it's completely pointless. Now this may have just been the developers trying to get us to go to a dungeon, gain experience from fighting enemies and solving ancient puzzles, but I guess we'll never know. We do learn our first word however from the word wall for unrelenting force, so I guess there's that. I guess we had to learn a shout so that when we went to 
the White Run Guard Tower upon our retrieval of the Dragonstone, when the guard asks us to prove that we were Dragonborn, we could shout something. What happens if you never got the Word of Power from inside the dungeon? I guess we'll never know. Wait, no, that can't be right, because later when we go and meet the Greybeards, they can just teach us the words to Unrelenting Force, so there really wasn't any purpose of going to retrieve it. If you think right now that I'm talking in circles, you're completely right, and I totally am. But that is what it feels like trying to articulate and explain the main story to people. If I am being too nitpicky, just click on the next timestamp in the description, but really, I'm just getting started. The next thing I take issue with is we are sent to go and retrieve the Horn of Jurgen Windcaller by the Greybeards. They're a group of monks who are able to shout like you, but they're not Dragonborns. They are shocked to find out that you are Dragonborn, and they send you to the Tomb of Jurgen to retrieve a horn. We again have no idea why we are going or anything, it's just kind of where they told us to go. There's no value on the horn, otherwise it would have been told to us, so again, there's no real purpose. Now the thing is, once we get there, in place of the horn is a note that tells us to go to Riverwood. When we go there, we meet Delphine, who is a blade, and was looking for us because she heard that the player was Dragonborn. But hang on just one second. Delphine says to us that she placed the note there, because she knew that's where the Greybeards would send me if I was Dragonborn as the player. However, how does she know that? She's a member of the Blades, and the Greybeards and the Blades have had beef dating back years. She would have no way of knowing at all where they were going to send us, considering she hasn't talked to any members of the Greybeards. Okay, fine. Maybe the Horn of Jurgen Windcaller is some super awesome magical artifact that everybody knows about that only a Dragonborn would be able to retrieve. That makes sense. But, but wait a minute. How did Delphine go and get it? She's just a member of the Blade. She isn't dragonborn or special in any way. How did she even access that area of the chamber when you have to shout to be able to get in there? I feel like the main story was rushed or something. It lacks depth, clarity, and understanding that many of the other quests in this game have. Please don't make the argument that it's better explained in some fandom lore page on the internet or something, because we're talking about the main game here, and we have no idea where we're going or what we're doing, because the game doesn't tell us. Next, Delphine says that the Thalmor know all about the dragons, so we are sent to infiltrate the Thalmor embassy and collect information on the dragon menace that they have. This quest makes sense as the Thalmor constantly have their noses in everything that have nothing to do with them. For all we know, they're just an army of squabbling elves that really are just annoying to everyone. You then embark on a quest where you have to smuggle in gear and then retrieve it, sneak through the embassy and escape with the information, and I'm a big fan of this. This is also likely the time most players stumble across No Stone Unturned, which is the questline that I mentioned earlier, as upon exiting the embassy, you can see this stone alongside this dead mage. Nice touch. After all of that happens, the main quest culminates in us using Dragon's Reach to lure a dragon into being captured, and then making a deal with him to take us to Alduin. Remember that if you haven't completed the Stormcloaks and Imperials questline, you actually now have to sit through 5 minutes of the most boring conversation in video game history while they decide that they shouldn't kill each other because of some threat from dragons that we never see. So again, a lot of sense there. We then take a portal to Sovngarde to kill Alduin, and then the main quest is complete. I actually completely left out one of the most pointless and annoying dungeon crawls in game history, where you have to go to this place called Blackreach to retrieve an Elder Scroll, and then talk to some guy who's crazy and lives in an igloo. Again, it doesn't make a lot of sense. When you finish the main quest, however, there isn't any form of celebration or gratification that comes with defeating the main enemy in the game. The main story just kind of dies, and that's it. There's no little notification that says, hey, you just completed Skyrim, or nothing really changes. No cutscenes, nothing. In Oblivion, Fallout, and other games, we get a little cinematic movie to explain to us how the province reacted, and what happened after we defeated the main story, and then credits. However, we never got that in Skyrim. There is no ending cutscene or anything, which was super disappointing. A lot of players upon completion of the main questline, which can take hours, would like some sort of conclusion or closure. I felt like the main story was lacking a sense of accomplishment for the player upon completion. When the game first released, players were confused if they had even beaten the game or not. I know that I sure was. But nevertheless, this was a giant missed opportunity for the developers. It almost seemed like the people at Bethesda decided that they wanted to have dragons inside the game and then had to come up with a way to incorporate it without really thinking it through. The ending once you defeat Alduin felt so cold, stale, and honestly boring to say the least. This game has so many amazing things in it, and like I said earlier, I still play it to this day. If I had to narrow down the worst questline in the entire story, I would probably say either the College of Winterhold more on that later, or the main story. It almost felt like we went through four years of university to not get a degree, documentation, 
or even proof of enrollment upon completion. The biggest part that annoys me is that there are so many better quest lines in this game, such as the Thieves Guild, which is going to be talked about next, where it actually baffles me how the same people that wrote those quest lines also were the writers of this one. It just seemed that life carried on as normal for the province of Skyrim and her citizens, and there was no closure provided to the player upon completion of the main story. By far my favorite questline in Skyrim was the Thieves Guild. There are so many cool things to touch on or explain that happened during the story, but first I will give you a brief overview however of what the Thieves Guild is and where it is located. The Thieves Guild is a group of thieves led by Brynjolf who we met earlier and Mercer Frey who serves as Guildmaster. They are located in Riften behind the Ragged Flagon which acts as sort of a front to their illicit business. They accept contracts from people all over Skyrim who need property repossessed, competition squashed, or anything else they cannot do themselves. Think of the Thieves Guild as a group of criminals racketeering, without the use of any violence. The story of the Thieves Guild flawlessly evolves from low-level and high-level petty thievery to grand heists and an incredibly interesting backstory. The storyline is actually so good that I'm certain that the same person who wrote this never touched pencil to paper regarding the main storyline. This is by far, in my opinion, the best questline in the entire game. It has so many unique characters and a completely unexpected ending slash storyline evolution. The characters in this guild feel real, they're criminals, thieves, and they absolutely love it. It seems like in the Thieves Guild, and to a lesser extent the Dark Brotherhood, that they have the only characters in the entire game with any passion for what they do. Delvin Mallory and Vex are two of my favorite characters in the whole game, and they aren't even considered main or essential characters to the questline. Essential may be, but what I'm talking about is they don't get the amount of screen time that other ones do. However, both of these characters have such an interesting backstory and character description, you can't leave them out. The guild gives you multiple radiant quests so you can keep busy, a solid 5-10 to 10 hour main questline, amazing armor perks, weapons, and unique abilities that you can take with you for the rest of the game. But enough of singing its praises, let us debrief what makes the Thieves Guild so good. After the quest with Brynjolf that I spoke about earlier, which was the one where we stole Medesi's ring, if you talk to him and ask to join the Thieves Guild, he tells you that you have to prove yourself by going around town and collecting money from shopkeepers who owe the guild gold. Your instructions are not to kill anyone, but otherwise show them that the guild means business. Once you brawl and beat the money out of them, you prove yourself useful to the guild, and they welcome you with open arms. Every guild should have an opening quest like this, which makes you get your feet wet and find out what the organization is all about. This is very essential to the main storyline, because it differentiates the Thieves' Guild from other, more violent guilds or organizations. The second mission is to sneak into this huge mansion outside of Riften. You must burn down three of the beehives and clear out the safe in the basement. This quest captures everything that the Thieves' Guild is. You really feel immersed in a part of the organization and feel like you pulled off something pretty huge upon completion. The quest is relatively hard which makes it very challenging, and much more rewarding upon completion. Events transpire that involve sneaking, stealing, and learning more background information about the guild, until you ultimately discover someone named Carlia. Mercer and you then travel to an ancient crypt to locate her, but you are shot down by an arrow from Carlia that paralyzes you in an epic, dynamic cutscene, which was really cool in my opinion. You then unsuspectingly find out that Mercer double-crossed you, and stabs you to what appears to be death as he delivers his final words, kills you, and escapes. This was a huge shock for the Thieves Guild, as your own guild master double crosses you in the bottom of an ancient tomb, leaving you wondering why. You wake back up with Carlia, and she tells you that her arrow actually saved your life. Carlia tells you that Mercer is stealing from the guild, and you need to go and warn everyone else about it. Once you tell Brynjolf that Mercer has been taken from the guild, you, along with Delvin, Mallory, and Vex, walk into the treasure vault to find it completely empty. It is this sort of shocking reveal that makes the Thieves Guild so much more interesting. I remember being so shocked learning all of this for the first time during my original playthrough many years ago, and it still shocks me and entertains me to this day. It is then discovered that Carlia, Mercer, and the former leader of the Thieves Guild, Gallus, were all Nightingales, which are sworn protectors of Nocturnal, and in turn for their service, they are granted special abilities. These abilities naturally translated very well to thievery, which was why Nightingales were so involved with the Thieves' Guild. This is an incredibly condensed narration and explanation of the main storyline with the Thieves' Guild, but I actually don't want to go into many details because I'm trying to avoid those certain spoilers. Now obviously I've spoiled a lot so far, but let's carry on. You then go along with Carlia and Brynjolf through an epic dungeon crawl, 
which ends you with discovering Mercer trying to steal the eyes of the Falmer. These are large precious minerals that were embedded in a large Falmer statue. This is one of the most epic scenes in the entire game, where once you defeat Mercer, the entire room begins to fill up completely with water, and the ceiling starts collapsing. During this time, the player has no way to get out without drowning, which was so incredibly scary during my first playthrough, I wish I could experience it again. Once you escape from the dungeon, you are sent to return the skeleton key back to the Temple of Nocturnal to restore peace and order. You discover that Mercer originally stole this key from the temple, and that was how he was able to infiltrate the vault in the guild without anyone else knowing. Upon completion, you're granted a permanent ability as a gift from Nocturnal, and Brynjolf assumes day-to-day -day operations, with you becoming Guildmaster of the Thieves' Guild. What I like so much about this questline is the twists, turns, dynamic animations, and the fact that upon completing the guild, it still serves a purpose. You were awarded handsomely for completing the quest with valuable items, gold, and unique abilities. When I first played through it, I was actually so upset that it ended. I was having so much fun playing it. The Thieves' Guild also opens up several merchants around Skyrim who will buy your stolen goods, giving you an outlet for any stolen merchandise you find. The Thieves' Guild questline is definitely the highlight of Skyrim, and unfortunately, when you compare this to the other guilds in the game, it only gets worse and worse from here. Continuing with the order of best to worst for the analysis on the many guilds in Skyrim, we will now look at the Dark Brotherhood. Now the first thing I should say that is if you want, in Skyrim you can actually completely destroy the Dark Brotherhood if you're a character playing as the good guy instead of wanting to become an evil assassin. The fact that the game includes this option is incredibly impressive to me, and I'll explain why. The developers must have spent countless days developing this storyline and 10-15 to 15 hours of overall game time. The fact that they even included an option to not force this storyline upon you, I thought in itself was unique. Most developers would have made you play through it with the mindset, we've worked hard on this, let's make our players have to do it. But that's not the attitude of Bethesda in this instance. It truly gives you the opportunity to find who your character is and what his moral standing is, in the game world. However, with these initial comments out of the way, let's take a look and break it down about the Dark Brotherhood. If you're somewhat new to Elder Scrolls games, or didn't really understand the Dark Brotherhood during your playthrough, here is a brief history and explanation. The Dark Brotherhood are a group of assassins who have pledged loyalty to the Night Mother. It is said that she and her child were the very first sacrifices to Sithis many years ago. It is unclear who the Night Mother is exactly, however in the book Fire and Darkness, The Brotherhoods of Dev, the Night Mother is identified as the Daedra Prince Mephala. Sithis is worshipped by members of the Dark Brotherhood and represents the void and eternal darkness. Perfect for assassins, I guess. There are many different chapters of the Dark Brotherhood scattered throughout Tamriel, and it is likely that you have seen them in previous Elder Scrolls games. The way that you meet the Dark Brotherhood in Skyrim, however, is sort of a unique yet funny story. In your travels around Skyrim, what you will hear from many people is that there is a boy in the city of Windhelm who is looking to call upon the Dark Brotherhood. There are many ways to catch wind of this quest, but should you arrive at his house, you will see that he has performed the Black Sacrament, which is the ritual necessary to summon the Dark Brotherhood. The player speaks with the boy and pretends that he or she is a Dark Brotherhood assassin, and the boy requests that you go to the Riften Orphanage and murder Grelog the Kind. She is in charge of caring for the orphans, however she abuses and tortures them. It's incredibly likely that she had mistreated the boy in the past, and now he is seeking revenge. Naturally, if you are a good or evil character in the game, it is easy to justify killing someone so awful in the first place. Upon getting rid of her, the boy will thank you for your service and the quest is completed. Now here's where it actually gets interesting. So eventually after a few days in game, a courier will find you and present you with a mysterious note from a member of the chapter in Skyrim. Should you then sleep in a bed, you will be teleported and brought to a mysterious shack to meet Astrid, who is sort of the main lieutenant of the Dark Brotherhood Skyrim chapter. It is at this point where you can decide if you want to destroy the Dark Brotherhood or not, attacking Astrid will trigger that questline, but continuing on and listening to her, you may begin your initiation. Now so far I'm a huge fan of the Dark Brotherhood, and that's a very interesting way to meet them. There are several interesting quests that go along with the Dark Brotherhood storyline, but I'm going to skip through the majority of it so you can experience it for yourself. It features many simple locate and kill missions, where you get to choose how a certain person dies. It is crafted in a way where you can obtain bonus awards, which are optional directions given by the givers of the contracts. This presents additional challenge and intrigue when completing what would be an otherwise simple job. 
The main plot, however, is someone has ordered the murder of the Emperor of Tamriel, which would be the biggest contract the Dark Brotherhood has accepted and fulfilled in decades. There is a ton of speculation that the Empire himself ordered his own death, but that is another story for another day on the channel. There is a ton of preparation for a contract this big, so the player completes what I call very preliminary missions prior to the final assassination. Where the main storyline was lacking intrigue, surprises, and parody, the Dark Brotherhood storyline never disappoints. Fast forwarding to the end, you are instructed to locate a chef in Skyrim called the Gourmet, as he is responsible for preparing food for the Emperor of Tamriel when he arrives in solitude for a guest dinner. You are first instructed to find out who the Gourmet is, as nobody really knows for sure. You will then kill him and assume his identity. Then you must travel to solitude and using his rite of passage, prepare food in collaboration with the castle chef and then give it to him. You will use a poison known as Jaren Root to kill him, but upon exit of the castle, you'll learn that he was a decoy or otherwise fake emperor, and that Astrid herself had actually sold you out to the Pentius Octolus, which are essentially the main bodyguards of the emperor. In exchange, the Pentius Octolus swore to Astrid that they would never bother the Dark Brotherhood in Skyrim ever again. Their leader, Commander Morrow, tells you that he has double-crossed Astrid, just as she has done to the player, and that while we are here standing on this bridge, he's not keeping true to his promise, and our entire sanctuary is being destroyed by his legion. Once you arrive back at the sanctuary, you will find that almost everybody there is dead. You are instructed by the Night Mother to hide in her coffin, which will allow you to survive the wreckage of the sanctuary. When this happened to me for the first time, I was blown away and genuinely felt surprised that Astrid would do this to us. I was curious about her motivations. Was she an undercover Pentius Octolus agent? Was it for money? Why would she double cross us like this? We later find out that earlier in the questline, since the Night Mother chose us to become her listener, which is a very prestigious position in the Dark Brotherhood, Astrid was actually furious. This provided her with the perfect motivation to try and eliminate our character and blame the enemy for it. We can clearly see her motivation, and the questline takes a shocking turn of events, which really leaves us surprised and motivated to keep on playing. Once you kill Astrid, you travel back to Solitude as the real Emperor's ship is still off the shore of Solitude. You sneak onto his ship through a unique entrance and then kill him, culminating the Dark Brotherhood storyline. Once the main plot is complete, you are responsible for rebuilding the Skyrim chapter with a brand new sanctuary just outside of Dawnstar and completing odd jobs for Nazir who is one of the remaining and loyal survivors of the original Dark Brotherhood chapter. You are able to take the new recruits to the Dark Brotherhood as followers with the main player. You may redecorate the sanctuary and then the game rewards you at the end with a large amount of gold and other unique items. This left a really good impression on me as I felt like I had a purpose to continue doing quests for the Dark Brotherhood and it didn't just abruptly end without any closure. We can clearly see the direction that the Dark Brotherhood is going to go from here, which gives us a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction with our actions, as well as the mark, the chapter of the Dark Brotherhood, left on Tamriel. I have mixed emotions when it comes to the Companions questline as well as the College of Winterhold. These are two of the four major guilds in Skyrim, and very similar to previous iterations of them in Oblivion. Now don't get me wrong, there are components of these questlines which I like, and some that I don't like. Although it doesn't compare to the Dark Brotherhood or Thieves Guild, we will sift through a couple of points and I will share my opinions on what I liked and disliked in relation to these two main factions. But you know the drill by now, before we begin, a brief history. We will start with the Companions. The Companions are the Warriors Guild of Skyrim, or the Fighters Guild, similar to other games. It serves a similar function to the Fighters Guild chapters of other regions of Tamriel. Yorlin Greymane, a blacksmith in Whiterun, states that they have been leaderless since Ysgrimor. He says that an elder known as Codlac Whitmane acts as the Harbinger, or Counselor. The fact that the Companions, contrary to the Fighters Guild, have no official leader is emphasized by their name. You can begin the Companions questline from talking to several NPCs throughout the game world, and it is incredibly likely that you will catch wind of it one way or another. They are a little apprehensive to recruit you at first, but once the player proves himself through some small jobs, you become a trusted member of the Companions. For the sake of context, the Circle is a group of some of the key members of the Companions, which is the group you eventually become a part of. The main Circle within the Companions are blessed slash cursed, depending on who you talk to, with the ability to transform into werewolves. The main conflict with the Companions involves the Silver Hand. The Silver Hand are a group of werewolf hunters, 
and they are enemies of the companions. Lycanthropes is the term in Skyrim, which means a man can transform into a werewolf. Hunters affiliated with the Silver Hand are known to brandish silver swords and seek to rid Skyrim of these said werewolves. The two factions are constantly at each other's throats. In one of the first missions when we learn about the werewolf form, it is shown to the player how strong that power truly is. Now the College of Winterhold, on the other hand, is essentially a group of mages who are teachers to Skyrim's up-and-coming wizards. It is seen as the authority of magic in the province of Skyrim, and also contains one of the largest libraries in all of Tamriel. The primary conflict for the questline, however, is mostly relating to a large orb of magic, which nobody knows the use for, and a member of the Sigic Order constantly contacting the player. The College of Winterhold can be learned about from any of the major NPCs or even minor NPCs scattered throughout Skyrim, and admission is granted to the player upon casting a spell as requested by this woman. I've lumped these two questlines together not to confuse you, the viewers, but because of their major similarities. I also don't feel it is valuable to include a description of the entire storylines due to the fact that I feel like they are incredibly boring. I have played through many different characters in Skyrim and completed both of these questlines multiple times, however I still fail to recall many of the key moments. This video is now longer than one hour, so I don't feel the need to waste any more of your time than I already have in discussing these two stories. If you're someone who wants to learn more about the Companions or the College of Winterhold, I suggest you either A, play the game yourself as if it's your first time playing through it, you may actually enjoy it. Or, there are plenty of other videos on YouTube where you can learn about the factions yourself. What I will say is that I really didn't like how both of these factions do not require the player to have any knowledge of the skills relatable to it, but here's what I mean. For example, the entire College of Winterhold questline can be completed completely without the use of magic, and the entire Companions questline, but to a lesser extent, can be completed without the use of a sword. This criticism falls mainly towards the College of Winterhold, but you'll see what I mean in a second. It does not matter what your playstyle is, the Dragonborn can become a student at the College of Winterhold and inevitably the Archmage. It does not matter how adept you are in the School of Magic. In comparison, you can also become the leader of the Companions at the exact same time. Call me what you like, but I feel like this takes away from the realism and believability of what these two organizations represented. In my own opinion, neither of these stories engaged me, but they aren't memorable and do not compare to the Thieves Guild or Dark Brotherhood by any metric possible. This is all up to your own interpretation though, and if you yourself are a fan of these two questlines, then I am genuinely happy that you got to enjoy this game more than I did. I never felt that the rewards from these questlines were anywhere near worth the time and effort that I put into completing them, however once again, that is all my own perception and opinion. I found that upon repeating multiple playthroughs of the game, these were always the two main storylines that I avoided. They never seemed to catch my attention or make me want to complete them. Maybe I just really like playstyles in Skyrim that contradict both of these guild questlines, but for the sake of this retrospective slash review, I am going to simply say that both of these stories were underwhelming to say the least. Now that we have got pretty much all of the vanilla game content out of the way and talked about, the last thing of note is the downloadable content or DLC, which was purchasable around a year after release. Now I am going to come right now and say that I really enjoyed all three of the DLCs and I thought that Bethesda had done a very good job with all of them. I felt that it was a fair and substantial amount of content, and we first started with Dawnguard, which revolves around a vampire conflict issue in the core world of Skyrim. The Dragonborn DLC, secondly, brought the player to an entirely new world called Solstheim, with all new NPCs, enemies, locations, and questline. Finally, and the last installment was the DLC titled Hearthfire, and this allowed the player to build his or her own home in one of three holds in Skyrim. Instead of going through each new piece of content and breaking down the entire story piece by piece, again we will take a more of an overview approach when analyzing each portion of the DLC. We will begin, however, with the Dawnguard expansion. In the Dawnguard expansion, the story is centered around the revival of an organization titled, you guessed it, the Dawnguard, who reside in a large fort to the south of Skyrim, but east of Riften. The amount of vampires in Skyrim has been growing as of late, and Isran has taken it upon himself to reform the Old Order to defend Skyrim from the vampire menace. Isran is the main leader of the Dawnguard, and he is the one responsible for reforming it. There are many ways to find out about the quest, however the most common is to overhear a town guard mention it in passing. Once you arrive, you complete several quests to begin overhauling the previously deserted fortress, 
and recruiting members to come help the cause. What I love so much about this quest line is that you are able to fight for either side and make your own choices. For example, once you meet Serana, who is one of the main characters in the expansion, you have the opportunity to either fight for her father, Lord Harkin, who's a master vampire, or fight for the Dawnguard Order and bring Serana over to your side. You were given multiple opportunities to make this decision, and the player really gets to listen to both sides, inform themselves, and make a decision regarding which side feels right to be on. A very common theme of my review in retrospective is that I very much enjoy this feature. If you are a good character or evil character, the decision about who you want your player to be is left up to you. The DLC also encourages multiple playthroughs, so you can encourage the storyline from both sides and live with the results. If you choose to fight for the Dawn Guard, there will be a large chunk of content you otherwise will never see, and vice versa. The expansion takes you to two unique areas as well, so we'll mention those here. The Soul Cairn and the Forgotten Vale. These are two areas that the player must travel to during the questline, which are some of the most unique and interesting areas across the entire game. The Dawn Guard expansion brings a ton to the world of Skyrim. It introduced the crossbow, gives you the opportunity to have new followers, completely erase one faction from the game world, and so much more. Dawn Guard is approximately 5 to 10 hours of game time, which in addition to the main story features many other radiant quests and a large supply of interesting characters and personalities. What I will say is overall, the Dawn Guard expansion was received very well by fans of the series, and myself included. The storyline is interesting and captivating, and once you begin, it is very likely that you'll become engulfed in whatever side you choose. There is so much player choice and freedom, and that is the main component that I like about the Dawn Guard DLC. Dragonborn secondly is much larger of an expansion than Dawn Guard was, very similar to the Shivering Isles back from Oblivion. This introduced a new area which was unique and refreshing as compared to the same old province of Skyrim that we'd already spent so many hours in. I want to begin talk by saying, if you are a fan of the series and someone who is genuinely interested in character backstories, Elder Scrolls lore, and the history of the world that you are playing in, then the Dawnguard DLC is incredibly interesting and an absolute wealth of information relating to the world of Tamriel. There are so many new cool areas, locations, weapons, and NPCs to discover, and a main storyline that is interesting to say the least. You can easily pull 25, maybe 30 hours out of the Solstheim expansion on your very first playthrough. And I personally have probably spent close to 50 inside this new area. There is so much to talk about I actually don't know where to begin, but let's begin with your arrival. When you arrive in Solstheim you naturally find a small town situated right on the waterfront with several shops and NPC houses. One of the most interesting characters that I found, however, was Glover Mallory. Upon arrival, I noticed his last name was similar to Delvin's, and I asked him about his origins. You learn that he's the brother of Delvin Mallory, father of Sapphire, and a member of the Thieves Guild. If you sneak into his basement and proceed through this locked door, you will find a Thieves Guild themed trophy room full of items and a unique Thieves Guild armor set. It is just a small example, but it is moments in characters like this who tie back to Skyrim and make the island of Solstheim so interesting. The expansion introduced several new weapon and armor sets into the game, which can be crafted using your smithing skill as well. The main storyline revolves around a mysterious cult attempting to bring back the island's former ruler, who is a dragon priest called Mirak. The story has incredible depth to it, and if you haven't completed this in any of your playthroughs, I strongly recommend that you do. With the island being in the realm of Morrowind, you will notice that the island looks relatively different than anything that you will see in Skyrim. This was a breath of fresh air for me, as putting so many hours into a single area of the game, I finally got a brand new area to go and explore. The main storyline in Solstheim has the player crawl through new dungeons, meet new unique characters, fight new unique enemies, and travel to some rather interesting locations inside of certain magical artifacts. If you've completed the Dragonborn DLC, you'll know exactly what I mean. Once again, I will stress that if you haven't played this DLC or haven't in a while, go back and complete another playthrough upon watching this video. This expansion is absolutely jam-packed with content, small details, easter eggs, and quests that you likely missed on your first way through. The map size is also very large, approximately the same size as Shivering Isles. I wouldn't exactly say this directly compares to the Shivering Isles from Oblivion, which was probably my favorite piece of downloadable content of all time, however, it comes pretty darn close. I found myself upon every playthrough completely immersed in this new area of the game, and after 50 plus hours of time spent on the island of Solstheim, I feel like I have barely scratched the surface 
on everything that this expansion has in store for me. Finally, the smallest expansion was Hearthfire and the third installment of downloadable content. And what this one did was add new items to the game, child adoption, the ability to marry other NPCs, however most notably, build your own house in the game. I will say firstly that the child adoption slash marrying dynamic is a very nice touch, but doesn't need to be exactly explained in this review. It is exactly what you think it is. Your spouse and children can live with you inside whatever place you call home, or you can live with your spouse. It does not have to be a house that you built yourself, it can already be an existing location throughout Skyrim. The more interesting part of this expansion, however, is building your own house. And there are some things that I like, and some that I dislike. First of all, the idea of building your own house upon the release of the trailer for this game absolutely blew my mind and I was constantly thinking of areas where I was going to build. It was then released with only three possible locations where the player could set up shop, and I was relatively disappointed. You also could not place the parts of the house by yourself because everything was built in a relatively linear pattern as per the way it was designed in the game. There were some levels of customization available, but not as many as I'd hoped. I understand that the technology for truly endless customization was not exactly ready yet, and we have seen how it was implemented in Fallout 4, and what an amazing feature that would have been for Skyrim. Imagine Fallout 4's settlement mode inside the world of Skyrim, now that would be something absolutely amazing. Fallout 4's settlement mode was clearly not perfect, but at least they found a way to add it in. It is likely that we owe it to Hearthfire for paving the way for the settlement mode to be in Fallout games, so hopefully all that we can expect from the next Elder Scrolls game is the inclusion of that game mechanic with major improvements. Once the player builds his or her house, there are plenty of customization abilities, and the house really does give the player a sense of accomplishment and enjoyment upon completion. Once again, the three locations does not give the player a ton of choice with where they want their house to be, but I understand this from a game dynamic. It would be incredibly difficult to code the ability to have every inch of the world buildable by a player, and that reality is incredibly unlikely for the future of Elder Scrolls games as well. The only thing I could have hoped for was more than three locations, but looking back on how old Skyrim truly is now, I really don't have the right to complain. Overall, I found that Hearthfire was a solid addition to Skyrim's family of downloadable content, and a nice cherry on top of what was certainly one of the best groups of DLC that we have ever seen released for a Bethesda game. If you have made it to the end of this video and you are listening to me right now, then you along with me truly have an appreciation for this game and likely hold it very close to your heart. When you think about it, Skyrim is almost 10 years old, but still has a community of players who are interested in watching a video this long explaining and critiquing something we hold so dearly. It was upon writing this conclusion for my video that it really hit me, how I found myself comparing this game released in 2011 to games released in 2019, which don't even hold up at all. Obviously, there were parts of this game that I wasn't a fan of, the College of Winterhold and the Companion's Questline, which I found too boring, some of the issues with the game relating to bugs and glitches pissing me off from time to time, but I always found that no matter if it was 9 years ago or even today, Skyrim is a video game that feels almost timeless and can be enjoyed by anyone at any time. It's no wonder that this game has seen countless re-releases in a remastered version, then on Nintendo Switch, and has sold as much for Bethesda as it really has. This is a really, really good video game, and to call it a masterpiece by Bethesda, to some, would not even be an overstatement. The game does a marvelous job of tying in what it feels like to roleplay a character to a unique and dynamic game world tailored to all audiences. My main takeaway is that even though this game was designed to appeal to everyone, Hardcore gamers and casual gamers can still enjoy it and focus on what components they like the most. My earliest criticisms about the Stormcloaks and Imperials questline was that the world didn't feel real enough and the war wasn't taken too seriously, but however if that was the case, it may have turned off some players who didn't want such a dreary and harsh experience when they're playing the game. No matter what side of the spectrum you come from, it is easy to enjoy a game such as Skyrim, and if you genuinely dislike some portions of the game, you were given the option to simply avoid them, which was very important to me. The ability to do whatever you want, go whatever you want, pick up whatever you want, and be whoever you want really sets this game apart from others in the genre. It is also this aspect that likely allows players to enjoy this game for such a long time, and we aren't even mentioning in this video that the modding community adds hundreds of hours of content to this game for players to enjoy. 
The best part as well is mods are completely free, so you truly can craft Skyrim into whatever you want it to be. Almost every day a new mod is being published that fixes something, adds something, or simply gives you another thing to do inside the game world. Now do we really owe credit to Bethesda for this, or do we owe credit to the modding community? For the answer of this question, I truly believe both. The modding community definitely gets the majority of the credit for keeping this game alive and adding so many different and unique things for the player to do. However, it is really important for the developer, Bethesda in this instance, to open up to the community and allow the game to be interpreted and modded as other people see fit. Some developers would never allow a group of people that they've never met to alter and mess around with their masterpiece. However, Bethesda understands that this is an important part of the community and welcomes these people with open arms. I'm sure that we will be sitting here in five years and people will still be playing Skyrim. It doesn't matter if you've played it once, twice, or 10 plus times like me, you still have fun. If you've played Skyrim, you have experienced a game that was truly ahead of its time, and that is what makes it so playable and enjoyable all the way to this day. Criticize the animations, quest lines, or the bugs and glitches, there are ways to tailor those facets of the game to your own liking through modding. So at the end of the day, what really is there to complain about? All things considered, I absolutely love this game and have enjoyed every hour I've ever spent inside of it. With Elder Scrolls 6 not releasing for at least a few more years, fans of the series are lucky that we still have a timeless, ever-changing, and long-lasting game such as Skyrim to enjoy for many years to come. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please do consider giving it a like rating down below and possibly subscribing to my channel. I have spent over 50 hours working on this video, and it has been the biggest project I've ever completed in my four years on YouTube. And if you did make it all the way to the end, then I am truly grateful from the bottom of my heart for your viewership. Leave me a comment down below regarding your thoughts on The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Remember that any opinions that I had in this video are my own, and not of the communities. Use the comments section below to share your thoughts, and respect the thoughts of others. However, without further ado, once again, thank you for watching and have a great rest of your day.